Located across the bandstand from the new de Young Museum in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park is one of the world's most innovative museum buildings and the new home of the California Academy of Sciences. Designed by Pritzker Prize winning architect Renzo Piano, the new building is a tour de force in high performance, sustainable buildings. The California Academy of Sciences is the only institution in the world to combine a museum, aquarium, planetarium, and world-class research and education programs under one roof. Here one can explore everything from the depths of a Philippine coral reef, to the canopy of a Costa Rican rainforest, to the outer reaches of the universe. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Gregory Farrington, and Dr. Farrington is the executive director of this wonderful building. I am indeed. Now, Dr. Farrington, I understand that this point of this beautiful building is to explain, explore, and protect the natural world. Well, first of all, the building houses the three main functions of the institution. We have a research function in the rear, that's the explore part. Mm -hmm. We have about 50 active researchers working in the rear of this building, as the Academy has throughout its history. We have the explaining part, which is the public area, which you see around you. That's sharing the natural world with people. And the protect, which we also call sustain, is all about the green nature of the building, from the living roof to the fact that the windows open, uh -huh. the fact that the, that the entire building is flooded with natural light through something called clear windows. Is there another building anything close to this in the world? Well, I don't know of any other uh, natural, natural life institution, if you will. I hate to call this natural history. I prefer to call it natural future institution. Right. That has been so beautifully designed to marry the architecture and the function of the building. Remember, most traditional museums were built many years ago. They have thick walls and high staircases and uh, big Greek columns. And, and they're crowded. And they're crowded, and you're supposed to get lost in them. It sort of is a requirement, <laughs> you know, and they're full of dioramas. Uh -huh. of the multimedia of 1960. But, but this institution was lucky enough to have a good earthquake in 1989. <laughs> so it had to rethink itself. Uh -huh. And so here we have a natural history, natural future institution designed to show what it means to be that kind of institution for the future. So it's an institution about life that's flooded with light, mm -hmm. that exposes the park to the visitors, which is flooded with light. So it's a beautiful fusion of form and function. Let's check it out. Come on. <laughs> Well, welcome to this marvelous institution. The words that we hear most frequently are wow and wonderful and marvelous and stupendous. But the very best response, my favorite so far, was a seven-year-old the other day who was down in the planetarium and grabbed one of our staff. He'd been having such a wonderful time that he said, are you a scientist? And the staff member, of course, had to say yes, regardless, but happened to be one. And the uh, seven-year-old said, I just want to give you a high five. This place is awesome. <laughs> now, if you can pass the seven-year-old test and get a high five and an awesome, you've succeeded. This place obviously has succeeded architecturally, too, because the other high five guy is Renzo Piano, who will be with us next week when we officially open to the public and look at the marvelous architecture that Renzo and his colleagues created. It's a beautiful fusion, a harmony, of the message, the mission of the institution, which is how did we get here, the origins of life, the unbelievable diversity of life, check out the rainforest, check out the um, aquarium, and how are we going to find a way to stay? Sustainability. That's why I call it a natural future institution and not really a natural history institution, because it's all about these two most important topics of our time, the nature of life, and how we are going to find a way to stay, we as humans, that is. The living roof of the Academy is a two and a half acre man-made wildlife haven, which provides natural insulation for the building. But a question arose in the design stage. How do you keep soil and plants on the domes of the rainforest and the planetarium? The solution was the use of 50,000 coconut husk 
fiber trays held together with tree sap. All the plants you see were grown on the Carmel Valley before coming here in these trays. The trays are kept in place with wire enclosed rockways called gavions, which serve to capture 90 to 98 percent of all drainage from rainfall. That 3.5 million gallons of water a year. What is not absorbed by the roof is collected by a pipe system that goes into a cistern close by, and that water is released back into groundwater. The roof garden is bordered by a glass canopy containing nearly 60,000 photovoltaic cells, which produce some of the Academy's energy needs. African Hall is the only hall from the original California Academy of Sciences that has been recreated in the new building. Here you will find 21 dioramas with a variety of mounted and live animals. But what draws the crowd is what is at the end of this hall. Through a 26 foot wide, 16 foot tall acrylic window, you can see African penguins. 20 of them from South Africa and Namibia. Seven of the birds were hatched at the aquarium over the past two years. They frolic in a 25,000 gallon tank kept at a chilly 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The penguins are fed twice a day and seem thoroughly at home now that they're in their new environment. So these different exhibits are highlighting different aspects of research that have gone on there, including um, a panel over here about uh, the Academy's first collecting trip to the Galapagos in 1905-1906. While the earthquake was happening here uh, in the city, there were Academy scientists out doing collections and what they brought back formed the basis of the new Academy uh, and it's still very important scientifically and we're using that to do um, studies using DNA from some of those samples now. Uh, so there's interactive exhibits here for kids, um, one in which they can role play being a scientist, an entomologist with a sweep net, and try to see how many insects they can collect in a certain amount of time. Uh, and then there's lots of exhibits to challenge kids that can read, that are reading age, and adults as well, to get them engaged in understanding um, the fact about evolution, that evolution has happened. We are. Uh, well, we don't talk in this particular display about humans as much. There is a display about human variation over there, but uh, we talk about uh, the processes of evolution and give some examples of... At the surface of the Philippine Coral Reef, you can follow a boardwalk and see sharks, rays, and sea turtles below. The Academy has installed 120 metal halide lamps, which simulate the intensity and spectrum of natural sunlight. As you gently peer over the bronze seahorse railing of the swamp tank, you will find Claude the Academy's albino alligator. Albino alligators are very rare and babies are susceptible to sunburn and rarely survive to adulthood. But here Claude resides in peace on a boulder, especially fitted with radiant heat.
In the area below the swamp tank, and Claude, the albino alligator, is the new Steinhardt Aquarium. It is one of the most biodiverse and interactive aquariums in the world. It is home to 38,000 animals, representing more than 900 species. More than half of the public space in the new academy is devoted to the Steinhardt Aquarium. New technologies and advances in animal husbandry have made it possible for the Steinhardt to create a suite of stunning new aquarium exhibits, including the world's deepest living reef tank, which you are now seeing. Later on, we will visit a four-level rainforest display and a unique and ever-changing water planet exhibit. Salt water for the aquarium is piped to the academy from nearby Ocean Beach, thereby minimizing the use of public potable water. Once thought to have been long extinct, the aquarium is now home to a well-preserved coelacanth. From the Steinhardt Aquarium, you pass through the flooded Amazon Tunnel, a 100,000 gallon tank containing arapaima, giant catfish, vegetarian piranhas, and tiny schooling tetras. Other live animals will include a giant anaconda, piranhas, poison dart frogs, parrots, and other free-roaming birds. Some distance beyond the flooded Amazon tunnel, you eventually come to an elevator, which takes you into the spectacular 90-foot glass dome of the Rainforests of the World exhibit.
The multi-level rainforest exhibit takes you on a journey through four distinct and diverse rainforest environments. From the flooded Amazon forest on the Steinhardt Aquarium level, to the Borneo rainforest floor, to the Madagascar rainforest understory, to the Costa Rican rainforest canopy. Temperatures here are maintained at 82 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, with humidity at 75%, with the use of a special missing system. But be prepared to feel the heat. It really does feel like a rainforest. So this is the rainforest right here. This is our airlock. This is how we keep the birds and the insects and the butterflies from getting out. Can you let me out? Yep. Now you can leave. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. One of the other pieces we have in there is a pledge station and the idea is that you make a promise about what you're going to do when you go home. And we know that you're more likely to keep your promise if your kids have watched you make it because now you are stuck with it. The other thing about this exhibit is that it's always changing and that's because the science of climate change and the solutions are always changing. I just emerged from the new Morrison Planetarium and it's absolutely beautiful. 
Um, I experienced a journey from this museum here to the farthest reaches of space. But for the purposes of this show, you will experience a journey from this museum to as far as Mars. If you want to see deep space, you'll have to come back here and experience it yourself. But uh, to go as far as Mars, come on in, I'll show you what we've captured. Seeing beyond, that's what scientists do. They see beyond the limits of the ordinary. Let's begin our journey by seeing beyond the dome around us. Did you feel that? That jolt of change? Good, that means you're ready. We are ready to see things in a new way from a life-changing perspective. Some might call this a bird's eye view, but we will be soaring much higher than a bird in our journey. Nearly two million plants live on the roof below, all native Californians whose ancestors arrived long before the first humans set foot on these hills. Old timers who need only a little rain and sunlight to flourish. We humans are different. We too are rooted to Earth, but we also transcend it. We can achieve a perspective that no other species has attained. Life attracts life. The two and a half acre living roof attracts birds and butterflies, moths and leaves. It buzzes with life, insulating and protecting the structure within. Below this rooftop island, other human-made islands thrive and beckon. Exhibits that recreate the rainforests of Borneo and Madagascar and the coral reefs of the Philippines. As we continue to ascend, we rise above the academy, in the middle of a park, in the midst of the city by the bay. Now the green we see below comes mostly from transplants. Like many of us, Life that originated elsewhere, but found a comfortable home here. Life not only attracts life, it nudges it aside, too. Some of these newcomers displaced native plants on this hilly peninsula. As we leave San Francisco Bay, we will use new eyes to see our planet and its diverse islands of life. We will see it from an astronaut's eye view as we take a virtual trip around Earth. Only that blue glow separates us from the void of outer space. Within that seven miles of atmosphere, all of Earth's weather resides. Within it, life as we know it evolves. All humanity's activities affect our world within this narrow band of air, Earth and ocean. From this distance, the curve of Earth emerges, that graceful profile of our planet in space. In its realm hangs the delicate balance of life on Earth. What can we learn about life as we look beyond Earth? It took the Apollo crew more than four days to travel a quarter of a million miles to the moon. It takes light about a second and a half to skip that stone. As we continue our journey, we will use light's more efficient measure to chart our progress. The moon is a good neighbor, but not a lively one. Thanks to the moon, Earth's rotation remains stable and we have regular tides. But the moon is too small to exert enough gravity to hold onto water in a protective atmosphere. And both are necessary for life as we know it on Earth. If the size of a world is important to life, 
Let's venture a little farther in our planetary neighborhood and find something more in our weight class. If we're the third rock from the sun, how about rocks two and four? The lines we see overhead track the motions of the planets in our solar system. We're heading in closer to the sun. Venus is nearly Earth's twin in size, only slightly smaller. But this cloud-covered second rock receives about twice as much sunlight as we do. That means it's hotter. Below those clouds, any similarity to Earth sizzles away. Greenhouse gases trap sunlight and temperatures soar to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Air pressure on Venus is about what a deep sea diver experiences a mile below the ocean surface. High temperatures and pressures make Venus an unlikely hideout for life. So what about the fourth rock from the sun, home to everyone's favorite fictional aliens, the Martians? To check Mars for real signs of life, we have to travel one and a half times farther than the distance from the sun to Earth. Sunlight here is half as intense as on Earth, and Mars is smaller, half Earth's size in diameter. Like the moon, tiny Mars has a hard time holding onto more than a thin layer of atmosphere. But long ago, things were different. Mars supported a denser atmosphere, and water may have flowed on its surface. Billions of years ago, Mars may have offered a better habitat for life than Earth at the time. Now the Martian landscape is dry and frigid. Visiting spacecraft have uncovered what looks like crumbs of water ice close below the surface. But real digging for life will have to go deeper. If the red planet harbors even microbial Martians now, they would require liquid water for sustenance which could possibly exist deep underground. Venus is too hot. Mars is too cold. Earth is just right. Did you know you were living on the Goldilocks planet?